Good morning, and welcome to today's webcast, Well-to-Well -well Tracer Tests for Reservoir Characterization and Measurement of EOR Effectiveness. I'm Pramod Kulkarni, Editor-in-Chief of World Oil Magazine, and I'll be your moderator today. Chemical tracers are being used in injection wells to determine the volumetric sweep, directional flow trends of the injected fluid, reservoir properties, and much more. Today's presentation will focus on techniques that are available for data interpretation of such tests and the information that can be useful for reservoir model optimization. Furthermore, it will also describe how these tests can be paramount for determining the effectiveness of enhanced oil recovery techniques in pilot areas before applying the expensive technique to the full field. We'd like to thank Tracerco for organizing today's webcast. Joining me today for the event is Sarika Pugla, Reservoir Technology Manager for Tracerco. Sarika joined Tracerco in 2014 as the Reservoir Technology Manager. She has 15 years of experience working in technology, developing new software for reservoir engineers, and driving sales in targeted markets. The majority of her experience was gained at Roxar. Highly qualified, Sarika has an MSc in Petroleum Engineering, as well as a PhD in Ultra-Stable Lasers from Imperial College in London, with an MSc and BSc in Physics. Her most recent work includes a thesis on optimization under uncertainty using proxies and posterior ensembles. In her role at Tracerco, Sarika is responsible for managing the development of Tracerco's innovative products in response to customer needs in line with insights and feedback. Her team is responsible for interpreting data, conducting educational workshops for customers, and providing consultancy to Tracerco's worldwide customer base. Following the talk, we'll have a short question and answer session. You can participate in the Q&A session by asking questions at any time during the presentation. Just type your question into the Ask a Question text area at the bottom corner of your screen, and then click the Submit button. You may enlarge the slide window at any time by clicking on the Enlarge Slide button located below the presentation window. The slides will advance automatically throughout the event. If you are experiencing problems with the program, please press the F5 key on your keyboard or close your window and relaunch the presentation using another media player. You can also visit our webcast help guide by clicking the help button below the slide window. Now let's get started. Here is Sarika. Hello, good morning. Um, I will be uh, talking about uh, interval tracer tests uh, um, in detail, um, and the agenda of the talk will be uh, simple. We will be introducing the technique, um, how to know more about your reservoir, and then uh, the science uh, behind the technology, water flood and injected gas well tracers, so what kind of tracers we are available, and then trace the project design, and site process, so how do we do the injection and sampling, plus data analysis, um, and then application examples, and, uh, and finally we will also talk about the re uh, remaining oil saturation measurement or the residual oil saturation measurements in the fields where we are applying the EUR techniques. Um, at the end, we will have a, a short session of the questions, as uh, Pramod talked about. Um, so let's start. What interval traces can tell you about your reservoir? Um, in a field, um, in a traditional oil field, um, the interval tracers can tell you um, um, so say there are injectors, these blue ones are injectors, and then there are the green ones that are the producers. Um, these green um, dots that you are seeing on your screen are the producers, 
and uh, interval traces will tell you how your field is connected. So it can tell you which injector is connected to which producer. You can see the lines there. Um, and, uh, and also, it will help you understand if there were any faults, so if there are any barriers that exist. So here we can see clearly that the field is divided into two parts and there is no connection between the two wells here. So there is an injector which is very close to this fault, but nothing goes there. Um, and similarly at, the, at this edge. <coughs> also, um, you can, uh, if there was a minimal connection, you will see those uh, connections and there, you can see if there is a cross flow happening between these wells or not. And finally, by, uh, by measuring the amount of tracer that is recovered, we can determine how much is the swept pore volume in each section. So each uh, injector well, how much is the pore, swept pore volume from each of them. And also the sweep efficiency can be measured. Uh, plus we can get m many more information, which I will talk about in the data analysis section. Um, and this is not just for one well. You will get it for all the injector wells that you have put the tracers in. So you can put unique tracers into each injector well, and you get this information for each section of the, uh, of the reservoir. So when would you use the interwell tracers? Um, at the pilot stage of a new flood project? or you could use it, uh, so basically you are just applying it uh, um, a, at the beginning of the project in a section which you have identified as the main section of your field. And, uh, and you can then scale it up to a full-scale uh, field. Um, and then you can use it for evaluating specific injector to produce a flow connections. Um, breakthrough allows the source of high water cut or gas ratios to be identified. So if you had gas traces in, you can actually identify where the higher gas to, gas to oil ratio is. Um, and if you have the water traces, that will give you information about the water cuts and so on. Um, then EOR studies, um, this is where uh, I was talking about the uh, interval partitioning tracers. They can be used for uh, if studying the effectiveness of an EOR technique. And this is something which is uh, becoming more prevalent in, in brownfields because uh, everyone is trying to use uh, EOR techniques to improve their production. So um, now I will go into the science behind the technology. Um, the main thing that, uh, that we have is uh, we have about 42 uh, water phase tracers, and then we also have, uh, um, we have about 17 gas phase tracers that, get, that can be uh, applied in a, in a well. And we are improving our number of tracers. So these are unique tracers, and they can be used in the same field uh, for different wells. So with the water flood and the gas flood tracers, uh, we, have, uh, uh, we have different properties. Uh, with the water flood tracers, they are inert chemicals that will follow and behave the phase of the water. So it will stay in the water phase. They are non-reactive and stable. Uh, no absorption or retardation happens in the formation, so we test for that before we put a tracer in the field. Uh, they should not interact with hydrocarbons, um, and they have low detection limits, so parts per trillion. Uh, we are improving the detection limits by using really advanced uh, spectrometers and uh, uh, and, uh, and we get really good uh, detection limits. So the lower the detection limit, the less will be the amount of tracer that we need to put in. Um, show minimal environmental consequences because environmental uh, issues are, are big and we need to be careful what we are putting inside the well so that we don't damage anything. Um, therefore, these tracers have been tested for, uh, for the environmental consequences that they uh, can cause. Um, they should be cost effective, um, and uh, we have about 42 water tracers that, that can be put inside the reservoir conditions. So they have been tested for different types of reservoirs, and different tracers are available for different uh, temperatures and pressures. 
Now, in terms of the gas tracers, um, they are also inert chemicals that will follow and behave as the injected gas mixture flowing through the reservoir. So they, they stay in, they do not stay fully into the gas phase. Uh, they are, they, they also kind of merge with the oil, uh, but generally, uh, their affinity is toward being a, towards being a gas. They are non-reactive chemical gas traces, um, and uh, they, be, they are stable at reservoir conditions. There is no absorption or reservoir rock uh, retardation, um, and uh, they should have um, vapor or liquid hydrocarbon sol solubility properties as, as close as possible to the injected gas so that we can follow it and the trend can be read. Um, they have low detection limits, parts per trillion again, um, and they show minimal environmental consequences. Um, they, will, they are cost effective generally. Uh, it only depends on the temperature of the reservoir. Sometimes we, we need to have slightly higher uh, price for the tracers because they, those are the, if the temperature is really high, then we have to think about that. Um, there are up to 17 unique gas tracers available depending on the reservoir conditions. Now, each chemical gas tracer has slightly different properties, especially the boiling point. Um, and the higher the boiling point of a molecule, the more affinity of the liquid, carbon, uh, liquid hydrocarbon phase in a reservoir. So basically, it, um, if the boiling point of the tracer is higher, then it will, um, ha it will move more into the oil phase. Um, and then, um, Extensive lab tests have been carried out to determine retardation effects of each tracer in specific reservoir condition, um, especially on oil type, reservoir pressure, reservoir temperature, and oil saturation. And if accurate transit times are required, rather than the interval communication alone, then we need to um, do these tests at specific reservoir conditions. And Traceco has the facilities of, uh, of a core flood system, which we can replicate the same as the reservoir conditions and, and test them and give you the exact transit times of the tracers. Um, but if a simple interval communication is needed, we do not do, need to do it, do the test at reservoir conditions. This is just a plot uh, or showing uh, the K values of these tracers. Um, these are some of the gas tracers. And you can see the boiling point on the, uh, on the second axis. And, and the KD, or uh, it's the... Um, is the KD value, which actually tells you how much affinity it has towards the oil. Um, we also do core compatibility testing for all, all the traces that we are putting it in the field. Um, so core testing carried out is uh, generally involves testing for retention. Uh, does a candidate tracer absorb uh, to a rock surface? And then also the retardation. Does a candidate tracer slow down due to rock or hydrocarbon pressure? So we test these things before we put it in the field. Um, we have worked for 30 years in this field, and then we have some experience of working with carbonate and sandstone. So we know some of the tracers that will work very well. But if a field is slightly different, we need to actually do these tests again. Um, Laboratory-based tests using packed or slim tube core testing equipment at reservoir conditions of pressure and temperature. So we do these tests at reservoir conditions so that we can actually get that, that same environment and work out the reten retention and the retardation. Um, tests carried out using naked and residual oil saturation so that we can measure the exact retention and retardation. Um, with the analytical compatibility testing, um, we also ensure that uh, Traceco can measure candidate tracers uh, at suitable limits of quantifi quantifiable detection. This is to ensure that after the tracer has, uh, has moved through the reservoir and we have got the sample with the tracer, we should be able to test it um, and detect it at the right limit. <coughs> normal produce water or gas and produce water mix uh, containing chemicals to be 
used using a project such as EOR. So we test it for different chemicals and we test it with them so that we ensure that our tracers are still detectable um, with uh, all those chemicals present. Uh, tracers have been tested against all common chemicals such as emulsion breakers, anti-foaming, uh, corrosion inhibitors, scale inhibitors, hydrate inhibitors, oxygen scavengers, and uh, biocides. So we've tested for all these things um, and ensured that our traces do not get lost because of these chemicals. Now for a tracer project design, um, generally we would send you um, a, a list of things that we need to know, um, and I will tell you exactly in the next few slides how we actually calculate this. Um, um, so basically we need to understand the objectives of the project, then um, we need to understand the tracer selection and compatibility testing, so we need to check uh, whether uh, our tracer is going to get lost because of the field uh, dynamics or something. Um, then tracer quantity calculation, we have to work that out before uh, the deployment. Um, we also need to uh, set up an initial sampling regime. So if we know that uh, the tracer um, breakthrough is expected in, in, say, not tracer breakthrough, but water breakthrough is expected in, say, um, half, uh, half a year, then we need to take that into account for in the initial sampling regime. And I will show you some examples in the, in the next few slides. Uh, but it is an important step uh, because if we don't have the right sampling regime, we will miss the tracer peak, and then the analysis is a, is a bit difficult. Um, we might not get the full information. We will get some information, but we will not get the full information. Then tracer injection and sampling strategy is, uh, is defined, um, and then we start the tracer deployment. And then the samples are taken, and we do the analy analysis of the uh, samples in the lab, so we get the analytical results. Then we get the data interpretation done here in our offices, um, and then we revise the sampling regime if needed, and monthly and, and annual evaluation of tracer data is done, history match to fit tracer data. If needed, we can help you set this up and also run it for you. Um, using your simulator, whichever it is, uh, but we, we have Eclipse here in our office. Um, and we can repeat the tracer application, uh, which is optional, uh, but, uh, but generally people tend to repeat after a few years because the movements, the sweep might have changed or the reservoir might have changed. A tracer survey can be designed in two ways. Um, one of the method is the analytical method, whereby we just do the volumetric calculation using uh, the following things, distance of injector to producer. So this is something which we will ask you to provide. Then thickness of the reservoir and net to gross ratio, porosity and uh, estimated saturation, injection split in a commingled injector. So if there was a commingled injector, we would need to know beforehand uh, what the split is between the two uh, layers that we are tra targeting or two parts of the reservoir that we are targeting. Um, and, uh, and we need to um, understand that beforehand. And similarly, if there is the production fluid mix, because if we can't take samples right at the exact well that we are trying to uh, read from, then we need to know the production fluid mix as well. Um, second method is the numerical method. This is more uh, of something which a reservoir engineer uh, would have done in their uh, work. So simulating the tracer response with the reservoir model gives additional safety, so we would actually use the tracer response that, that uh, we can put in um, in the simulation model, and that will give us an idea of how much tracer should be put in. But <coughs> one needs to be very careful with this, uh, because uh, sometimes if the, tr if the simulation model is not good, then it might give you very small amount of tracer to be put in. And, um, and that uh, can be bad because if there is a section of the reservoir that has not been properly specified in the simulation model, we might miss information that we could get from tracers. Um, 
Uh, but the good thing about the simulation model is it can take uh, layers, relative permeability, falls into account. Um, injection and production changes into account as well, plus if there are any new wells that are coming into uh, production, that can also be useful. Um, so it, 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 it has the ability to forecast the tracer production profile, tracer quantities that are needed, and also the sampling schedule because you n roughly know when the tracer will arrive um, through, uh, in the well. Now, um, with the volumetric design, um, as I said, we will take the interval distances. So if uh, we will need to know uh, what the X and Ys are on this scale. So if, say, there is a, po a polygon that we are targeting um, and we are trying to work out the volume of that polygon. Um, so we take the <coughs> thickness of the reservoir and net to gross ratio. Um, and, and also the porosity, so we multiply all this with the ed estimated saturation. If there is, uh, a, the gas tra tracer is being used, we need to know the pressure of the pressure and temperature for the gas. And also the gas lift ratio is needed, plus the production fluid mix in common flow line. So we will take all that into account and then work out how much tracer needs to be put in the well. Now, with the commingled injection, as I said, we also need to know the split between the commingled injection. Here is an example. Uh, you can see that uh, we are targeting a pore volume of 1 million barrel here and then 10 million there. And wh what we want is that uh, there should be 1 kilo of tracer that goes in here and 10 kilos goes there because there is the 70-30 split. We need to work out how much tracer should we put in at the top to make sure that we get 10 kilos at the bottom. And for that, uh, we will actually do some calculations. So uh, we would uh, take into account that there is the 0.7, we divide the one kilo by 0.7 and we get 1.4 kilos. And similarly, we, with, the, with the 10 kilos, we divide it by 0.3 because only 30% of the tracer goes in there. So we get 33 kilos. And if we add the two, uh, we will put in like, we don't need to add the two because we, we only need one kilo of tracer there. We will be overloading it anyway. So what we do is we take the 33 kilos that we got and we put it in the well and we end up having 23 kilos at, in the top layer, which we are overloading to ensure that we get 10 uh, kilos in the next one. Now with the common flow lines, we just have to be careful and um, the dilution can happen and poor volume must be taken into consideration when calculating the amount of tracer into, to inject. Because this is very important, we need to know if, whether we are taking the samples at the individual wells or whether we are taking it only at the, um, at the common flow line. Now, injection and sampling, um, this is an on-site process, and, uh, and we tend to help, uh, we, we tend to provide all the equipment and everything, um, and we will work with your team um, to, to do this injection. Uh, tracer analysis is able to measure very low detection limits, parts per trillion, as I said before, um, and this means low tracer quantities required, portable equipments can be used, no disruption to the normal operations, so you don't have to shut down the well or anything. No requirement to shut the well. Um, the tracerco analytical techniques only require 100 millimils, uh, millimeters of gas and uh, 25, 25 mils of water for, some, uh, for, for actually doing the tracer analysis. So we only need a small amount to take out for sampling. Um, generally, the sample is, uh, is collected, uh, we complete the paperwork, or uh, whoever is collecting the sample will co complete the paperwork, fill in the water sample or the gas sample in the gas canisters that are provided, um, label the sample, place the 
the sample into a box um, and seal the box and then send to send to Tricycle. Uh, we do have labs around the world where we do the analysis, so I will talk about that in a minute. But um, basically, it is a very smooth line process, so we, we just need to mark it correctly. Here, um, we have samples uh, taken from, uh, I'm just talking about the sampling again. Uh, samples are taken from producing wells at regular intervals to measure tracer content. And then they are taken more frequently immediately after the injection, depending on what type of breakthrough we are looking at. So if we were looking at like a two years of breakthrough, then we might not take quick uh, samples. But if we are looking at like six months, then we might take more samples at the beginning. Um, frequency is dependent upon injection rates and formation volume um, and the quality, as well as the distance between the injector and the producer. So this is the sampling frequency that we are talking about. Um, special care is required to prevent sample contamination, so we, we really need to, to keep them separate so that we don't end up mixing two different production wells. In the case of gas, CAT tubes or on-site lab setup option is also available. And now with the sampling frequency, here uh, are some examples. We would actually uh, generally ask you what expectation do you have for the water breakthrough? And here what we see is that um, with the day's breakthrough, we would take samples very, very early. So we would start with on the zero to three days. We would have two hours. Every two hours we are sampling. Then three to seven days we will um, uh, sample every four hours and so on. So it's increasing as we go along. Um, with the week's breakthrough, we will sample every day for the first seven days, then two days, then three days, and so on. But this is dependent on the actual reservoir conditions that we are working with and also the distance from, uh, for the, in, from the injector to the producer. Um, now, if there was months breakthrough, we would only take a few samples. So here we are saying that uh, zero to 26 weeks, we will only take a uh, sample every week. Um, then we will take two weeks and then so on. So it depends on what the expected breakthrough is like. Now data analysis. <coughs> In terms of the data analysis, we have strategically located labs around the world. Um, so we have a lab in Oman um, in, uh, in the Middle East. Uh, we also have a lab in Abu Dhabi. And uh, we have a lab uh, in Asia, in Malaysia. And uh, uh, we have a lab in US and, uh, and, and in Brazil. Um, and UK is our main lab. But we can also provide mobile laboratories, which can be set up anywhere uh, around the world. And here's one example, I think. Tracercos can set up analytical facilities at worksite, ensuring accurate data collection and delivering results in one hour. So that can be done very easily. And this is an example of the on-site analysis lab. So you can see it can be set up. This, is, uh, this com uh, container comes with all the equipment in, um, and, and the, it can be set up very easily uh, wherever it is. Um, right now, I would uh, like to, before I go into the data interpretation section, I just have a poll question uh, for you. You can see it on the screen, and I give you 30 seconds uh, to answer it, and then we can look at the results. Okay. So um, I, I see most people think that it is December 2016. That's when the oil price will start rising again. And I have the same feeling, um, but let's hope it, it, it comes quicker. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> for the data interpretation, um, we tend, tend to um, use two different types of machine. One is the uh, normal GCMS, 
um, and uh, we can also use the triple quad machines. And um, the reason we use the triple quad machine is that uh, it actually reduces the background. And here you see an example of a tracer, tracer production uh, output. So you can see here, this dotted line is the normal GC analysis. Um, and that's uh, the x-axis is the days after injection, and we are also seeing um, the same no normal tracer response on both both sides of the axis here. Um, but um, what we see is that uh, with the normal GC analysis, we only start seeing the uh, breakthrough at around 15 days or 16 days or 14 days. Um, but with the um, with the triple quad machine, because it reduces the background, we can see the breakthrough start, uh, starts to be much earlier. And also, the peak um, is, is roughly the same. But uh, what we see is that uh, we can actually see the actual uh, slowdown of the, of the tracer drop. And, uh, and this, this is a long uh, um, profile and this allows us to do further analysis because here we are only seeing till 30 days whereas with the triple quad machine we see it till, till the 85 days or so now <laughs> here is a typical produ uh, data production curve from a from a tracer sample uh, what we see here is um, this is uh, the first breakthrough and uh, we are only seeing the x-axis because it, the concentration levels are in PPT or uh, whatever um, condition you want to put it in. Um, and this is the first time of breakthrough. Then um, we have the mode, which is the peak. The actual peak is the mode. And then we see the exponential decay. So exponential profile shows homogeneous flow. So if there was uh, another peak that comes up, which, we'll, uh, which I will show in an example, um, we would uh, relate it to different layers that are present in the reservoir. Whereas if we are just seeing a smooth exponential decay, that means that it is uh, a very homogeneous flow. Also, uh, with, with this kind of curve, we can actually work out the mean residence time of the tracer. Um, the mean residence time is the time at which uh, the tracer production drops down to 50%. So basically, 50% of the, of, the uh, of the total tracer has come out. Um, and then rest of it is coming out slowly. So this is uh, something which we can actually analyze from the tracer curve by fitting an exponential decay and actually get the number of mean residence time. Um, I will be talking about that kind of analysis further out in, in the slides. Um, now here is an example of, uh, of different layers in the reservoir um, which are contributing to tracer, but uh, what we see here is that uh, uh, <coughs> the, this is the actual curve, so we see the curve here um, that came out, so this is a tracer profile, and then we can relate it to uh, different um, layers. So what we see here is that uh, there is one layer, that's the top layer, that is coming down, and then we have the green, which is the second layer, and then we have the third one. But what we cannot say specifically is that which layer belongs to which profile, unless we have the PLT uh, output from this well. If we have the PLT output, we can look at the water production and we can look at the um, oil water um, production and then we can kind of relate it using the layers. Um, and say that this layer belongs to this region, that layer belongs to that one, and so on. Um, but, uh, um, but it is still useful to know that the reservoir has heterogeneity and how many layers are present in that particular section of the reservoir. Now, there is another method of, um, of analysis of the tracer, which is called the mean residence time method. And in that, we can actually get um, um, recovery, um, and we can also work out the mean residence time, as I said in the previous uh, few slides. 
Um, but there is also a simple method where we actually just work out the recovered tracer mass. And this is just based on the mass balance. So we work out the total recovered tracer mass would be um, CT, which is the concentration data. So that would be in parts per trillion or parts per billion. Uh, times the concentration volume that we are producing of the water or gas. Um, and then uh, we just integrate it over time and we get the recovered tracer mass. And percentage recovered uh, is, is just basically divided uh, by the total mass that we injected um, times 100. So that's the percentage recovered tracer mass. But this is a very simple uh, calculation. Um, and um, and uh, sometimes we need a bit more uh, than this. So I will be talking about uh, further work that we are doing in, in terms of the interpretation. Now, fr from the first slide where I showed the recovered tracer mass, we can also work out the swept pore volume. Uh, swept pore volume is uh, equal to the percentage of the injected rate times the mean transit time. So if we had the mean transit time of how long it took for the tracer to arrive from one injector to the producer, then we know the mean transit time from there, and that gives us the, um, the swept pore volume. Now with the age distribution method or the mean residence time method, there is um, uh, a simplicity that we don't rely on the wo produced volume because sometimes the produced volume of the water is not taken um, daily or sometimes not even taken uh, on individual wells. It is actually just an allocated volume that is measured. Um, so to avoid that, what we can do is we can actually multiply um, the, uh, the um, tracer recovered um, by the injection rate. So now what we do is we are multiplying it by injection rate and then dividing it by the total mass that is injected. So we get an age distribution function which is now, now not dependent on the concentration curve or the injection rate. It's only measured in time inverse. But it's the same sort of curve that we were seeing with the concentration. And this curve allows us to do uh, further calculations. And what we see is that we can actually start um, um, fitting to the exponential part of the curve. So ET is equal to BE, uh, this is the typical exponential equation, where B is the intercept, exponential, uh, natural exponential, and then A is the exponential decay. And once we do the fitting to this curve, we can use uh, these, this curve to determine the mean residence time of the, tra uh, of the tracer in the field. And, uh, and here are some examples. You can see that ET is equal to CT times cubic inch. And this is a very similar profile to the concentration curve. This was an actual field uh, example. And what we see here is that uh, we've done the fitting uh, for the exponential decay, so we got the numbers for that, and then um, we can start looking at the flow capacity versus the um, storage capacity. Now, flow capacity is uh, is just a measure of the pore volume through which the flow is occurring. Um, and it can be worked out very easily from the age distribution func uh, function that we calculated. And, and here is the equation. I won't go through the equation. But basically, we are trying to now um, understand the flow and the geometry uh, of the reservoir. Um, and similarly, we can also work out the pore volume open to the flow. And once we have the flow capacity and the storage capacity, we can plot this um, on, uh, on a curve. And you can see here, uh, what we see is, uh, is um, is a curve that looks, the blue line is the actual curve, and the, re, the orange one is, the, is just uh, um, showing extremely homogeneous flow. So it's just showing that this will be an ideal reservoir. Um, now from this curve, what we can determine is that uh, we can determine the Lorentz coefficient of the field. 
um, and the Lawrence coefficient of the field, by, by field I mean the area that we are actually sweeping. Um, and uh, and the uh, Lawrence coefficient is just a measure of the area under the blue line and the yellow uh, and the orange line divided by the uh, triangle that is the area of the triangle uh, formed by the orange line and that's a simple calculation and it gives us the measure of uh, of the heterogeneity of the field there is an equation written here but basically it's just doing what i was explaining that it is actually working out the area of those lines and just dividing by each other and then uh, also we can work out the Dijkstra-Parson coefficient, which is a measure of permeability, and uh, and this gives us so much more information uh, about the reservoir properties that uh, that we do not know about uh, in in specific. And it can even if we know, uh, it can confirm that this is what is happening inside the field. Um, furthermore, from these uh, measurements, we can actually get the pore, pore volume swept, and the pore volume swept is, uh, is just a simple calculation where we are actually looking at the ratio of the tracer mass that is recovered times the injection rate uh, times the T star, and T star is the mean residence time, and mean residence time is worked out in this form. Now, um, we can also um, look at the pore volume and the sweep efficiency measurement. So here there are some uh, equations again, but pore volume estimates follow directly from the mean residence time, and the fractional recovery of the tracer is taken into account, and then that uh, gives us the information about the total pore volume that is being swept, and also we can work out the sweep efficiency using the age distribution method rather than just looking at the uh, mass recovered. Um, and there are other things that we get from the age distribution method. There is the information about the normalized sweep efficiency with respect to the dimension less time. Now here I'm just showing one well. If I had more than one well, I will be able to see different curves for each well. And I can identify easily um, which well is going to have the quickest water breakthrough. And that will allow me to do flood management. That, that will tell me, okay, since this injector is going to, uh, to have the, is going to cause the breakthrough very quickly, let me reduce the injection in this part of the, of the reservoir and let's see what happens. So then you can do like interactive flood management and that will allow you to delay the water breakthrough but produce the same amount of volume um, of oil um, or gas if you are working with gas. Um, and then uh, the, you can also plot a, a curve between the normalized interstitial velocity which is uh, calculated using this equation. But normalized interstitial velocity is uh, effectively a, a permeability, um, and we are plotting it with respect to the storage capacity, which is a porosity. So this is actually showing us the porosity permeability relationship in that section of the reservoir. And that can be useful sometimes to just get idea of whether my porosity permeability are related or not, whether they have a, a linear relationship, whether they are changing independently of each other, and so on. Um, <coughs> numerical simulation can be used to design and uh, predict the tracer flow, concentration, and production totals. Um, for a partitioning tracer, the output is available for each phase, so we can actually work out the, um, the, uh, how much is, uh, is the gas and how much is the oil. Um, and then movement and displacement of initial oil plus free or solution gas movement can also be worked out, uh, plus the contribution from specific regions or layers can be worked out. Um, 
Now, we can modify the porous medium properties to actually get a history match uh, of, the, of these uh, fields, and also um, this will lead to better predictions. So once we have the tracer data, we can actually include it as part of, of uh, your simulation model, and then we can kind of history match it further to improve uh, the history match, first of all, and then also leading to better predictions. Um, we have a, a Schlumberger Eclipse license uh, and in-house reservoir engineers that can carry out that kind of work, and uh, we would be interested in working with you on these kind of projects. Now, here is an a, 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 in this section, I will cover some of the a, examples, uh, not too many, but uh, just quick examples of what we can achieve from these uh, tracers. Um, an oil field operator wanted to uh, understand the communication pathways in this region of the, uh, of the reservoir. Um, it's a nine spot uh, water flood operation. Um, and what they wanted to see was the sweep efficiency between the wells, track preferential flow directions, and resolve the source of water production in a number of wells. So what they did was they injected the tracers and then um, the results uh, showed that there was a, a preferential flow trend in an east northeast to west southwest direction and you can see here these are these blue things are the injectors and you can see it's flowing towards this direction and similarly for the other injector the red lines you can see where it's going and the black ones are the producers in this uh, plot um, the case study was very useful. Um, it actually uh, defined the directional flow pathways. Um, it redefined and improved the reservoir model because they could match uh, better. And then flow behavior and patterns and production geological models were also uh, produced, uh, improved. And then um, new flow barriers and faults were discovered, plus rapid uh, interval communication via conductive faults were taken into account. So this is just a, a simple water flood study where we only did the directional studies and also did the calculation just based on the uh, calculation of the tracer recovery, just based on the mass, uh, mass balance equation. But we can also do the further analysis using uh, the age distribution method. Now, um, here is a gas flood study. In this case, we have the, um, the yellow ones are the fault lines, you can see, and, and the red are the fault lines as well, yellow and red. Um, and then the producers um, and the injectors will be plotted. So these two are the injectors. So there is one injector um, here. Uh, at the bottom of the um, of the section of the reservoir, and then the other one above this fault, so you can see. Um, and we had the producers P1, P2, P3, P4. The field operator wanted to explore connectivity between all the wells, so we, they wanted to check what, which one is connected to what, and they wanted to see if there is any communication between this fault or not. Um, so that's, that's what it's talking about. And then uh, what we did was we mobilized uh, the field and injected five kilos of unique gas tracers into injection wells, I1 and I2. So I2 was the one that is uh, above the fault line. And the injection period was one day with no disruption to the normal operations. And after injection, customer staff sampled the production and they, um, for seven month time period. <coughs> and what we found out was that, uh, that the I1 was connected to these three wells, so P1, P2, and P4, but not to P3. And I2 was not connected to any wells. So it gave confirmation that this fault line was actually closed, so there is no uh, connection between, between these sections of the reservoir. Um, okay, so now before I go into the uh, um, uh, remaining oil saturation calculations, I would uh, like another poll. I would like to know um, how beneficial do you see reservoir interval measurements using traces 
to uh, to manage the reservoir management strategy. I'll give you 30 seconds and then I'll, I'll show you the answers. Okay, so yeah, no, it, it is uh, it is good to know that uh, in a number number of cases it would be beneficial. So 65% of the people think that way. Great. Um, so remaining oil saturation measurement. Um, this is something which uh, um, which is um, being used nowadays uh, on on re relatively new uh, relatively old fields. Uh, so that we can actually um, start uh, uh, checking in the pilot areas uh, whether the EOR technique is going to be effective or not. So how does it work with partitioning traces? Um, using, uh, it uses partitioning and the non-partitioning traces, first of all. Both traces are added to the injection well together. Um, and then during the transit time, what tends to happen is that uh, a passive tracer moves only with the water. So this passive tracer is only in, the, in, in one phase, so it stays only with the water. Uh, and the non-partitioning uh, uh, non tra partitioning tracer interacts with the residual oil and becomes static. Uh, for um, for finite periods of time, so it will go and get stuck uh, with one in the section because there um, there is no mobile oil or no, almost no mobile oil, um, and then as as it starts moving again, uh, there is a delay. So the passive tracer comes out at a, at its standard time, whereas the partitioning tracer will actually take longer to come out. And as it takes longer, we get the difference between the two peaks, and that difference can allow us to do the calculation on the remaining oil saturation. And here we are just going to show you with the slideshow um, how it happens. So I, I think it will be slow, but uh, let's try. So here we have the reservoir. Um, and the tracers are moving here. You can see there are two tracers, the blue and the red one. Um, and the red one gets stuck and then the other one moves and so on. So it keeps moving. You can see these are moving now. The blue one are going really fast, so blue ones are going here. The red one gets stuck again and then the blue one goes out. So it's basically uh, the blue ones are the passive tracers and the red ones are the, non, uh, are the partitioning tracers and they, they take longer time to come out. And finally, both of them are out of the reservoir. Um, so what are the benefits of this technique? It's a non-intrusive and a low-cost test. Um, and benefits are being compared to the, um, to the um, this is an interwell technique, but you can also do a single well uh, partitioning tracer. But we are comparing this to the single well partitioning tracer. So it's a non-intrusive and low-cost test. Um, it provides measurement of oil saturation in the region between the injectors and the producers as opposed to a surrounding, surrounding a well bore. With a single well tracer, you would only get the information around the well bore. Uh, tests can be run during normal operation, no loss in production, and it assumes that the tracer contact immobile oil in water out zone. So that's, that's an assumption because if the oil is still moving, there will be some... Um, we, we won't get the right calculations. So here is uh, what the theory is. Oil saturation is related to the time lag, and it's given by TP, which is the peak of the partitioning trace uh, of the partitioning tracer, and T and B, which is the peak of the non-partitioning tracer, and then we kind of uh, work out. Um, work out the oil saturation based on, on this equation, where K is the tracer partitioning coefficient. And tracer partitioning coefficient is just measured in our lab uh, at reservoir conditions, and this, uh, this is a ratio of the concentration of oil found um, and the concentration of water. So we do the measurements uh, in our lab for the part tracer partitioning coefficient K. 
Ideal candidates for this type of uh, project would be relatively mature flooded reservoirs. Um, injection well to produce a distance should not be too far because we need to have a reasonable time period to do these measurements. Um, then well pair need to communicate. Um, ideally should have been traced to verify communication speak. By this we mean that we should do some tracer tests beforehand, interval tracer tests beforehand to ensure that there is sweep. Uh, sweep efficiency uh, between the wells should be reasonable as only SOR or to water flood will be measured and not an un unswept formation. Uh, production well must be uh, able to lift fluids to the surface. If there is no fluid coming out, we will not be able to do the measurements. And then formation should be reasonably homogeneous. Um, by this we mean that we actually need the peaks to be consistent and we, we can do the measurements properly. <clears throat> And here we are going to, um, I'm just going to show uh, some examples of what we have done in the, in the laboratory. So uh, prior to using the passive and the partitioning tracer, we actually do some measurements and laboratory-based core retention and retardation tests are done for, with the naked and the residual oil saturation core. So we will ask you for all these to be provided. Uh, partition coefficient testing at reservoir conditions and also the analytical compatibility is tested. Um, therefore, we need core sample or reference to similar rock that can be bought, dead oil from the field, gas sample, or if H2S is present, then we will need the recipe or the composition. Then formation and produce water from production well close to the study area, and then injection water from the injecting well, uh, well so that we can actually do some uh, tests in the lab. Um, and here is just uh, two methods that we use. One is the agitated recombination cell, uh, whereby we are actually uh, just shaking vigorously and we are doing the measurements of the, of the uh, partitioning trace, uh, coefficient. And then we also have a packed column, but we are also um, uh, going to have uh, the core flood system set up in the lab where we are actually going to do these measurements. Here's, here's just an output showing tracer response um, at different times, and we can then work out the partitioning coefficient from there. Um, so Traceco mobile, mobilizes samplers to take samples based upon um, expected breakthrough, and then normal water samples are taken, plus sampled on a regular basis during production from uh, all, all target wells. No need to stabilize the samples. Um, now, um, this is uh, just to show that we can do the data interpretation of the saturation um, measurements using two techniques again. One is the residence time distribution method that I was talking about before for the interval tracers. And it's simple, we can actually work out the volume of the water that is being calculated using this equation, which I can talk to you about in detail if needed. Um, and the oil volume is worked out from from the same type of equation. And then once we know the volumes, we can work out the saturation, oil saturation. Um, and also, um, there is the tank method, which actually just takes the peaks into account. And uh, the two peaks will provide us the delay of the partitioning tracer, so beta, which is the delay of the partitioning tracer. And from beta, we can work out the oil saturation. In the next slide, I just show you an example, and that, that's it. So beta here, um, we are seeing that uh, the, the pa passive tracer comes at about 10 days, the peak comes at 10 days, and then uh, for the partitioning tracer, it is at 24 days. And what we see is that beta is uh, worked out to be 1.4, and if we take 1.4 and put it in this equation, we then get a uh, oil saturation of 38%. So this is a simpler method, but uh, we can also do the age distribution calculations and, and give you the oil saturation from there. Um, the only thing I want to point out here is that the presence of mobile oil will actually cause uh, the oil saturation measurement to be lower than the actual measurement, so we need to take that into account. Some of the reservoir simulators will, uh, will take this uh, uh, into account and will give us better measurements. 
um, and we can do that calculations, especially Eclipse can do that. Um, and then finally, if there are any questions, I would be happy to answer. Okay, um, there is a question uh, from Mohammed Kasim. Um, what is the difference between a triple cord and a normal GC analysis machine? I think I covered it a little bit, but I will say it again. Uh, a triple cord machine is, is an advancement to a normal GC. Um, it is still a GC, but uh, what, we, um, what we have is that uh, the triple cord machine actually takes the background noise away and therefore it gives you better measurements. So um, previously if we were doing the um, water measurements uh, or water tracer measurements using um, a GC, a normal GC analysis, then we would get parts per billion, whereas with a triple cord machine we can go down to parts per trillion. We will get the same measurements, but we get it for a longer time. Um, so here's another question, uh, Mr. Jalal Mazloom. Can we use different traces for different layers in commingled wells? Um, it's an interesting question. Um, it's difficult, but it can be done as long as we can actually block somehow the layers. Uh, but uh, but it's difficult because uh, if we can't block one layer and then put the tracer, it, it, if we can't put the tracer first and then block the layer, then the tracer will still end up in the in the layer below, and it will be very difficult to to work out uh, any results from there because it's it will end up in all the layers. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting question. Ideally, it would be nice to do something like that. Um, then there is another one. Um, can the tracer analysis be performed in well site or sample needs to be sent out to the lab? Um, as I said, we can set up uh, uh, mobile labs uh, in, in the area where you want to do this measurements, um, but we can also, um, uh, also provide uh, support for, for the people, the chemical analysis people that, chemists that, that are needed. I'll take another question because we are just uh, over one hour and then I think rest of the people who have asked for questions, I will send them the answers later on. Um, so here, um, uh, what about condensate reservoir tracers? Um, well, condensate reservoir tracers, um, yes, we can work with them, but we need to do some testing. And we also need to ensure that we will be able to measure. So we might need to do some uh, some tests, or um, I will also check with my um, um, my colleagues here if they have worked with condensate reservoir tracers before. Uh, but um, I think it should be possible. But I, I need to confirm this, and I will get back to you on that one. Um, right. Thank you, everyone, for your time, and I will pass you on to Pramod. Uh, thank you, Sarika, for the insightful presentation and the question and answer session. We are not able to answer all of the questions, but the Tracer Code team will go through all the questions and be sure to provide the appropriate answers. This webcast will be also available on demand for a year if you'd like to review the presentation at another time, or have your colleagues view it as well. Thanks for attending this webcast, and thanks again to Sarika and the entire Tracer Core team for this valuable presentation. Good afternoon or good evening, as the uh, time is uh, at your location, and thank you for attending. Good morning, and welcome to today's webcast, Well-to-Well -well Tracer Tests for Reservoir Characterization and Measurement of EOR Effectiveness. I'm Pramod Kulkarni, Editor-in-Chief of World Oil Magazine, and I'll be your moderator today.
Chemical tracers are being used in injection wells to determine the volumetric sweep, directional flow trends of the injected fluid, 